Hello, I'm Pastor Jeff Bravis, and I'm so excited for you to join us here at First Baptist Church of Soldiers Praise. If you want to learn more about us, you can check us out on our website, ssfbc.org, or you can check us out on any of them. Hello, I'm Pastor Jeff Gravens, and I'm so excited for you to join us here at First Baptist Church, Sulphur Springs. If you want to learn more about us, you can check us out on our website, ssfbc.org, or you can check us out on any of our social media accounts. If you would like to give to help support our ministries, you can do that at ssfbc.org slash give. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Come on in. Make your way in. Uh, we have the great privilege of beginning worship this morning with the celebration of baptism. It is in baptism that a person declares their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it's also in baptism that they unite with Jesus in both his death and his resurrection. It's a powerful symbol of new life in Jesus Christ. I'm standing in a bunch of water, but there's no power in the water. The power is in the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb of Easter morning. Um, our scripture tells us that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. We're going to see that but lived out before us in baptism. As three people are buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk a new life in Christ. We get the privilege of beginning worship with the celebration of baptism. We also have the privilege of celebrating the baptism of a father and two of his sons. And here in a moment, we will baptize James Privet and his boys, Colton and Jackson. Colton and Jackson both made professions of faith within the children's ministry of First Baptist Church, and along with those professions of faith, they expressed desire to be baptized. And then that decision, that desire of Colton and Jackson led Father James to a point of decision uh, where he too decided that he wanted to be baptized. James had made a profession of faith as a young boy, but his family was never really committed to church, so he never followed up that confession of faith with baptism. But from the encouragement of his two boys, he said, I need this as well. Uh, th this will be a spiritual marker for my boys and for my family. Uh, so it is with great joy that I ask James Privet to enter the baptismal waters. James, I ask you uh, two questions. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you commit to follow him all the days of your life? I do. With that confession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and raised to walk a new life in Christ. I ask Colton, who is 13 years old, to join me in the baptismal waters. Colton, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you commit to follow him all the days of your life? Colton, because of that confession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Jackson, he was nine years old.
Jackson, uh, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And do you commit to follow him all the days of your life? With that confession of faith, it is my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk a new life in Christ. As we continue in worship, for those of you who have been baptized, I pray that this brings up fond memories of that moment you made a confession of faith and brings up this desire in you to follow Jesus Christ all of your life. If, if you have not been baptized, I, I pray that this stirs something in you, that it opens up your heart to the truth that your Savior is Jesus Christ and he caught, requires, he, he calls you to follow after him. Let us continue in worship.
let's turn around and greet each other this morning. You may be seated. Welcome to the 830 service of First Baptist Church. Whether you are joining us via the internet, radio, TV, or you're here in person, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship together this morning with us. Just a couple of things to bring your attention to. Well, first let me say if you are a guest with us, welcome. We are glad that you are here. In the pew back in front of you, you'll find a blue card that looks just like this. We call it a connection card. If you'd fill that out, and in a few minutes, pass, as the plate is passed around, if you would put that in there. Whether you are a guest or a longtime attender here, there's also a green card. It's our prayer request form. Uh, if you have anything you'd like for us as a staff to pray for, we would be glad to do that. Just fill that out and also put that in the offering plate as it is passed around here in just a few minutes. Let me bring your attention to the altar flowers this morning. They are in loving memory of Vernon Davis, given by... Ruth Davis and her family, and we appreciate how they add to our service. Also, you'll note that there's a rose on the organ. That is in honor of the birth of Alexander James Hellman. He is the son of Angela and Sam Hel uh, Hellman, and we celebrate the addition to their family. One more thing. Today, we meet at 4 o'clock for our evening worship service because of our Super Bowl. Well, it's not ours, but there's one going on. So we hope that you'll join us again here at 4 o'clock. Let's continue with worship.
sing in worship this morning. I'd like to ask you to do for do something for me and for us before I pray. I'd ask you to intentionally agree with me as I pray for us using some of the Apostle Paul's powerful scriptural prayers that he prayed for the um, churches that he ministered to. We know that there's great power in agreeing prayer. Agree? Okay, here we go. Heavenly Father, we 
agree with you that you are the fount of every blessing and that indeed you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as you have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before you. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for such a high calling, for you have granted to us everything necessary for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his life and godliness. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would grant us individually and corporately according to the riches of your glory to be strengthened with power through your spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of your love and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge and that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And Lord, we know that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly all that, that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Lord, also, I would pray and ask that we may be filled individually and corporately with the knowledge of your will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to your glorious might, Heavenly Father. And Lord God, I pray that you would count us worthy of our calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power in order that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in us and we in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Heavenly Father, concerning the offering you're about to receive, I pray that you would give us a strong desire not only to give our finances, but to give our bodies as living sacrifices and make us good stewards of what you have given us individually and corporately. I pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord of Nazareth, in Jesus' name. I'd like to give you a verse first. John 3.16. How does it start? <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, it's on. It's on. S repeat with me. John 3.16. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. There is no greater love. Hallelujah. The love of friend and lover has often sweetly sung, but no greater love than the Savior can be told by mortal tongue. There is no greater love than that of Christ above.
As we draw our attention to the Word of God, would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do confess that we are prone to wander, uh, prone to leave the God we love. Father, it is our prayer in this moment of reading your holy Word that you would take our hearts and seal them for your courts above that you will use this moment in your word to build up your church. May we hear it. May we have the ears and the hearts to hear it and receive it. And may you give us the strength, the passion, the courage to live it out. And Father, I pray as the one with the task of preaching that I would be faithful to your word and your word alone. May, may this be about you and not about me. May these be your words and not mine. We pray all these things in the name of our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The church can be many things to many people. The church, you know, it can be a cruise ship, a cruise ship offering Christian luxuries to the whole family, sports, entertainment, child care, business meeting and greeting opportunities, and even weekly worship services. The church can exist to meet the needs its members. Or for some, the church can be a battleship. 
the church can be designed for a purpose, for a mission. Now, you'd have to agree that when it comes to a church, the battleship would be better than a cruise ship, but it, it still gives the impression that all the work done is done here. Perhaps a, a better image would be not a cruise ship, not a battleship, but perhaps the better image is the church as an aircraft carrier, like a battleship. The aircraft carrier does a, a lot of work, but it's not done here. The, the aircraft carrier actually equips planes for the hard work done somewhere else. As the church, we're not called to stay and be comfortable. Rather, we're called to go and be obedient. And we'll see that yet again from Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 24. Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 24. As you're flipping there, this is the conclusion to our sermon series on the discipleship strategy of this very church. We began in the first week looking at the call to go and make disciples. We, we stress that if First Baptist is going to thrive, we have to be obedient to Jesus' call to go and make disciples. And in the previous two weeks, we've, we've looked at the specific strategy of how this church goes about making disciples. We've looked at the church gathering and the church growing. And this morning, we come to the church going. So you join me, Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and through 24. If you've got that open, can I hear a big, loud amen? Amen. This is one of those passages that's really fun to read. A bit scary if you read it expecting to have to live it out. Uh, so buckle your seat belts. Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Amen. Amen indeed. We've looked at our discipleship strategy, gather, grow, and this morning we come to go. And from this passage, I exhort you to go, be a servant. Go, be a servant. In our passage this morning, the Apostle Paul demonstrates the attitude and the behavior of a servant. He wants nothing but faithfulness to God. He, he wants nothing but opportunities to preach, to testify to God's grace. And he tells us that he wants that. He, he desires that even if it includes prison and hardships. He, he tells us that he will gladly endure prison and hardships if that's where the Holy Spirit leads. My question this morning where is the Holy 
Spirit leading you. I, I don't think Paul's words that we just read are the specific task given to him. I think what we just read is one individual person explaining the task given to all followers of Jesus Christ. We're not called to stay and be comfortable. We're called to go and be obedient wherever the Spirit would lead us. The Apostle Paul shows us that obedience is going to require servanthood. That's where it gets difficult. Because many of us we don't want the seat of servanthood. We want the seat in the corner office. We want the pedestal of prestige and popularity. But Jesus Christ calls us to something greater, even if it looks like something lesser in the eyes of the world. And if we're true, truly reading our Gospels, we, we can't miss this. Jesus says things like, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's Mark 10, 45. He, he says things like this, Whoever wants to be great among you must be a servant. It's Matthew 20, 26. And one of my personal favorites, Luke 9.23, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross daily, and follow me. I take all of those passages, all of those words of Jesus, all of the examples that Jesus provides for us, and, and I take the, the words of the Apostle Paul here in Acts 20 and I call people to join me in a life of servanthood. And I want people to join me that will echo the apostles' words. I, I consider my life worth nothing. And I know that's countercultural. I know that's not what you're taught in school and not what you see on TV or hear in the news. But, but I want people to echo with me. I consider my life worth nothing. My only aim is to finish the race and the task given to me. We roughly ha have a church of 900 people each Sunday morning. Give me, give me a hundred devoted to living the life of a servant in the name of Jesus Christ. Scratch that. Give me 50. Give me 25 people devoted to giving their life in the name of Jesus Christ and we change Hopkins County in the image of Jesus Christ. Be a servant. Go be a servant. But, but looking at the discipleship strategy of First Baptist Church, Sulphur Springs, it takes some work to get there. So while we call you to go be a servant, we ask you to go serve inside the church. And I realize that you hear that. You, you hear the preacher saying that, and you go, of course, the preacher wants you to serve inside the church. Uh, but I promise you, th this is not solely a recruitment tool, you know, though it is a recruitment tool, but it's not solely a recruitment tool. It, this is not some call that keeps us going. It's not some act of self-preservation. The church is a training ground. It's a training facility. We, we train you 
here. And for that to happen, you have to find places to serve. It's inside the church that you, you are filled with your identity in Jesus Christ. It's inside the church that you understand your God-given gifts. It's inside the church that you begin to put those God-given gifts to work. This should be a safe place for a collected group of people to, to gather in worship, to grow. And hear me say this, perhaps fail and grow some more. And this is where you understand your identity in Jesus Christ. You, you become aware of your God-given gifts and you begin to put them to work. If, if you know where your God-given gifts are, if you know an area in which you can serve, jump in and serve. If you're not aware of your God-given gifts, but you know you need to serve somewhere, jump in and serve. And perhaps fail and go, that's not it. Right? Somewhere along the line, we got it messed up where we thought if you served inside the church, it was a lifetime appointment. Right? That if you agreed to serve once, you were going to do it until the day you die. And, and that understanding, we, we have a lot of people doing things that probably are doing a great job doing it, right? And, and then some that might be more effective serving somewhere else. Or, or it may have led some to be fearful to join in and serve because they thought, well, if I do this, I'll be doing it till eternity. If you know where you're gifted, jump in and serve. If you don't know where you're gifted, jump in and we'll help you figure it out out this can range from long-term high commitment things like teaching a bible study class or or leading a new life journey class or or serving on a regular basis over at the rock or or, or it could be lower time commitment low lower commitment levels like volunteering for a week at vacation bible school it sounds silly saying that that's a low commitment level but i meant it just last a week right it's hard work but it's only a week of service uh, you can volunteer at things like vacation bible school or you can spend a weekend at, as a sponsor of one of our camp trips uh, or you can help at one time one morning or one afternoon events i could tell you my my pastoral heart was thrilled and I mean that. My, my pastoral heart was thrilled when, when I showed up last Saturday to a little event we called Pas Breakfast with Pastor Jeff. And I walked into the kitchen and, and I saw a crew cooking bacon and sausage and eggs and biscuits and, and gravy. And I wasn't thrilled because of the food, I, I was thrilled because of the servants. That group cooking that morning, minus one couple, the rest of the crew were people that have joined our church since I've been here. Amen. Yes, you had Tisha, Riley, and Rainey, Rawls, Paula Rodriguez, Jenny Quast, and then the veterans of Susan and Wade Johnston. Serving inside the church can look like many different things, including cooking bacon. Amen? Amen. We, we routinely have a Say Yes campaign. That's our way of alerting you to volunteer needs within our church. The next time that goes around, look for it. Be ready for it. But don't wait until the next Say Yes campaign. Serve now. And, and I say all of that. Be a servant and serve inside the church to say this. This is a training ground. The church should be a training facility. If you're not serving here, it's very unlikely that you will serve somewhere else. So serve here to prepare you for something greater, which leads me to the last point. Go be a servant. Go serve inside the church and go serve outside the church. Our passage this morning, the, the Apostle Paul demonstrates the attitude 
of a servant. He, he wants nothing but faithfulness to God. He wants nothing but opportunities to testify to God's grace. The greatest opportunity for you to testify to God's grace is not in here. And the greatest opportunity for you to testify to God's grace is outside of the campus of First Baptist Church. Outside of this campus is, is the mission field for those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So, so as a church, a part of our discipleship strategy is we want to give you on-ramps. We want to give you access to training opportunities so that you can live a life of testifying to God's grace. You'll be hearing about this all very soon, but we are finalizing uh, the mission trips that will take place through First Baptist Church in 2020. We'll make a mission trip to El Paso, Texas to help Sun City Church that we sponsored. We'll take the mission trip to Milwaukee. We'll have ongoing mission projects at Lakeview Baptist Encampment. We'll, we'll do a disaster recovery mission trip. Our middle school and high school will do the work camp mission project. And all that information is coming to you soon. Those are on-ramps for you to work out your God-given gift and testifying to God's grace outside of this campus. Yet, back to our, our passage this morning, I don't think that church-sponsored mission trips are what the Apostle Paul had in mind here. And if I could be completely transparent with you, I don't even think that mission trips are the best way to live out what the Apostle Paul mentions here. Mission trips are training. Mission trips train you to testify to God's grace. And in that training, they should lead you to testifying to God's grace to your neighbor, to your co-worker. We started this series by looking at what we have come to call the Great Commission. Jesus has called to the church to go and make disciples of all nations. Well, guess what? Included in all nations is your next door neighbor and your co worker. Who will reach them? I guarantee you a mission team from some other church is probably not going to show up in your neighborhood. A mission team from another church is probably not going to show up in your workplace office. Who's going to reach your Neighbor, your co-worker, that's right, you. As we try to put a bow on this, I, I, I want you to spend some time thinking, some time praying, and this week to come, and that's my charge to you, don't put this off, don't say someday, this week. How can you serve a neighbor or a co-worker in the name of Jesus Christ? Ponder it. Think it over. And then live it out. May nothing keep you from completing the race. May nothing keep you from the task of testifying to God's grace. We have a church, roughly 900 people each Sunday morning. Give me a hundred 
devoted to living a life as a servant. Scratch that. Give me 50. No, give me 25. And we'll change Hopkins County in the name and image of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you allow us to be a part of your church. We are grateful that you allow us to play a role in your work. Father, I pray that as the pastor of this church that I, that, that I would be faithful to the race and the task that you've given me. And I would lead this group to do the very same. Father, I lift up those in our worship center, and those in the chapel, those watching on TV and the internet, those listening in by radio. May we see your goodness. May we see that we have a Savior in Jesus Christ. And may we follow you in obedience, even through hardship. May we live the life of servants. We pray these things. So thankful that you hear our prayers. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to conclude worship um, this morning with an opportunity for you to respond. And we're going to do that by some singing. Uh, the song, uh, it's a it's a song, but in reality, it's a prayer calling out, you know, change my heart, oh God. May this be an invitation now. Uh, you guys have known, you know where in the last week that you have been faithful and you know the ways in which you have wandered. Thankfully, we serve a God of grace and he offers forgiveness. And he calls us to follow him. And let this be a, a time of invitation where we all cry out to God, change my heart. And may it lead us to service. As, as we sing, some of you may want to come down front. There will be a team of us up front. Perhaps we can have prayer with you. Perhaps God's calling you to join this church. Perhaps uh, God's calling you to enter the baptismal waters. However God is speaking to you, Know that he's welcoming you with open arms. We have a Savior who died on a cross for you. He died on a cross for your sins, and he rose from the dead to give you life. Run to him and feel his grace. If you're willing, let us stand and sing. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever.
Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You've been blessed this morning. Can I hear a big loud amen? Amen. I know, I'm going to make a a quick confession. I know that the end of this service gets kind of awkward, right? Maybe there's these moments in which you feel called to come down front, but you know, you know, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's almost time to start Bible study. I I can't go down. I got to get out of here. You can respond to God anytime, any day of the week, right? That, That doesn't have to be limited here. Don't let the limitations of this service stop you, right? We would always love to pray with you once everybody else gets out of here, right? If God's working in your heart and you need us to help you walk through that, don't let the awkwardness of the end of this service stop you, nor realize, nor don't fail to realize that we're here, not just Sunday mornings, right? We, we have a church staff that loves you and cares for you, and we're here for you when you need us. So I'll leave you with a blessing uh, from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Job. We hope to see you next week on our campus. We have worship service at 8.30 or 11, and you can attend Bible study at 9.45. We have something for all ages. We want to see you here. If you have any questions about our church or would like to submit a prayer request, you can do that by sending an email to info at ssfbc.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope to see you next week.